The Breaking the Curse series by Jerry and Glyne to link is The Curse of Lust preface This book is not intended to be an exhaustive writing about curses or any one type of curse, but a primer simple enough for even a new Christian to gain a basic understanding or overview about curses and how to break them. The information in it should be complete enough to help you get a basic understanding of curses and begin removing them from your life. Jerry and I are just a couple of Christians who have a passion for sharing what Jesus has done for us, the difference he has made in our lives and happiness we have found in serving him with our whole lives. We want to help as many others as possible find what we have, a happy, peaceful life lived in the purposes of God. What began our journey of writing these books on curses was when the Lord spoke to me when I was studying for the spiritual warfare series I was teaching on Blog Talk Radio, and he began to reveal the generational curses on me. As time went on, he continued to reveal other generational curses, in areas where I had struggled for years to get free with no success. Each time, I got immediate relief when I followed the steps and broke the curse he revealed to me. At last I understood what had frustrated me for so long dash why I was casting out the demons and still not gaining freedom. Jerry and I talked about the curses, and how we have seen the effects of curses in the lives of those around us. We agreed we wanted to help others get free as well. And so we began to work on the Breaking the Curse series. We hope it will help you and those you love to find new levels of freedom and joy. May God bless you now and always, Glinta and Jerry Linkus are you suffering from the curse of lust? So how can you tell if you are suffering under the curse of lust? The curse of lust is probably easier to detect than many other curses, because the constant torment of the spirit's insatiable appetites will not let you rest. Demons have an agenda and this one's agenda is to satisfy its lust using your body's appetites, and to cause as much destruction in your life as possible as it does so. The curse of lust often travels generationally, it can start with lustful or adulterous fathers, fathers who are addicted to pornography or who molest their children, or fathers who committed fornication out of lust prior to marriage. If lust is there, and there is no repentance, the curse can come. Another interesting thing about the lust spirit is that if you take a stand against it and get victory over, say, sexual lust, the way it seems to manifest most often, this spirit will simply move to another appetite in your body and torment you there, like as a lust for food. Since I have seen this spirit do this so frequently and since I suffered from food addiction in the past myself and know how miserable it is, I have included a prayer to break the lust for food in case this has happened to you. This is not always the problem behind food addiction, but it can be. Some signs of a curse of lust are, addiction to pornography addiction to sexual gratification of any kind uncontrollable promiscuity unnatural sexual attractions, pedophilia, homosexuality. Bestiality The spirit of seduction is one of many spirits that works in conjunction with the spirit of lust. If it attaches to you, you will begin to dress and act seductively, even without realizing as sometimes. It will work through you to seduce anyone around you it can, sometimes even people of the same sex. If this spirit is attached to you, it must be cast into the abyss when you break the curse of lust in order for you to be fully free. Some of the other spirits that can be nesting with a spirit of lust, and which can also be the names of more curses, are, fornication adultery perversion homosexuality and lesbianism harlotry and whoredoms pedophilia weak in lust after other things besides sexual things, too. Some of them are. Money, power, beauty, fame, success, prestige, a large ministry, food, drugs, even shopping another thing the Lord revealed to me, and this is just one more example of how we reap exactly what we sow dash every time dash if the spirit of seduction gets on you and you begin dressing scantily, sexily and all that, 
and inciting lust in others, you yourself will also not be able to break free from lust. The reason is because as long as you are sowing seeds, you will be reaping a harvest. I suffered for decades with all sorts of ills and when I was younger and married to someone else who is now deceased, and he never seemed to have anything positive to say about anyone or anything the whole time we were married. To add to it all, we lived in terrible poverty throughout the twelve years we were married. I know now that my then spouse and I were both living under many terrible curses dash curses that fell like a scourge raining an evil inheritance down on two unsaved, unaware young married people who had no understanding of why our lives were so hard, but whose hearts were hardened against a loving and merciful God who only wanted to do us good. No wonder life felt so heavy and was such a struggle. We were living under a terrible inheritance we had no way to defeat because we didn't know Jesus. We had inherited the iniquities of many forefathers and didn't know it. When you inherit the tendencies of unrepentant forefathers, you commit sins without really understanding what is driving you. You try to stop with no success. You commit evil for no good reason and suffer the consequences and don't even understand yourself why you are doing it. As Paul said in Romans, you don't understand why you do the things you hate. Romans 7:15 I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate I do. My, present, husband Jerry also had a very difficult life, and has spent much time in prison. We have discovered many curses he was living under that came from his father and forefathers as well. He has voiced more than once the way he would sometimes think before how no matter how hard he tried to do what was right, nothing ever seemed to go right, and he often wondered why. Like me, he was very discouraged and didn't know how to fix what was wrong. When life feels like no matter what you do, nothing right ever happens anyway. It is hard to hold out hope that anything is going to get any better. If your life feels like that, we want you to know you can be free. What is a curse? A curse is basically the opposite of a blessing. A blessing brings good fortune, courage, honor, fruitfulness, good health, enjoyment of family, success and prosperity. A curse brings the opposite dash bad fortune, fear, dishonor fruitlessness, bad health, estrangement from family, failure and constant lack. There are more curses, but those are some of the more common ones. Is your life cursed or blessed right now? Which one sounds more like your experiences? Blessed or cursed? Most people have a combination until they learn about curses and break them. A curse is basically the legal right for demons to afflict you or cause you harm or loss in a particular area. A generational curse is a legal right for demons to afflict you based on evil done, sins, by your forefathers that they never repented of, that you then opened the door to. You are not guilty of their sin, but the tendency to sins they didn't repent for may fall on you, until, Unless you are a believer of Jesus Christ who has the knowledge to break the curses off your life. Where do curses come from and how do they get on you? So where do curses come from and how does a curse get on your life? God created the entire world. Since he made it and it belongs to him, he made the rules for how it would run. One of those rules is that he is the only God and people must worship and relevance only him as God. He is also a very holy God and he doesn't like sin. He wants people who believe in him to try to be as much like him as possible, and he gives us the power to do that, a little at a time. If people don't worship and relevance only him as God, there are consequences. One of those consequences is a curse on that person, and sometimes a curse that passes to their children, if that person is male. Most of us understand what it means to be blessed. It basically means favor with people and circumstances and good fortune and plenty, good health, good relationships, fruitfulness in our lives, that sort of thing. 
to be cursed is just the opposite, it's not having favor dash people not liking you for no reason, circumstances going against you instead of in your favor, such as a storm comes through your neighborhood and yours is the only house damaged instead of being blessed and your house being the only one the storm missed. To be cursed means bad fortune and living in poverty, not for short periods of time, but all the time, constant sickness or disease, accidents, job troubles, relationship problems, barrenness and nothing to show for your life no matter how hard you tried or how much you worked. That's what a curse is like. The original curse came because of sin, in Genesis 3 but it is important to realize that a curse is like a spiritual law. If we obey, we'll be blessed. If we refuse God and disobey, our lives will be cursed. We can easily see that spiritual law throughout the Bible. The first curse was on the serpent, the devil, who tempted Eve to sin, causing sin to enter all mankind. Genesis 3:14-19. 14 And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dost shalt thou eat all of the days of thy life. 15 And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. 16 Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. 17 And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commended thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In Sarah shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life, eighteen thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, nineteen in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. In this curse, Women were cursed with sorrow in childbirth and being ruled by their husbands in marriage, along with enmity with Satan, and men were cursed with hard labor dash working the ground for food. There are many different categories of curses and they cover many different areas of life. Different kinds of curses have different sources. 1. Sin Curses. This is a curse you bring on yourself, like the original curse in Eden. Certain sins bring a curse according to spiritual laws set up by the Lord God himself when he created the world and gave his word to us. The Bible tells us what these are. I will tell you a story later about one I brought upon myself that the Lord revealed to me. 2. Word Curses. Words are very powerful means of cursing. Most people don't mean to put curses on others or themselves with their words, though some do it purposefully. You can break word curses spoken against you once you identify what they were. You can break word curses you caused to come on yourself as well. I will tell you a story of one word curse that manifested in my life. 3. Curses on Places Places can be cursed because of wrong things done on the land. I will share with you a story related to me by a young woman that the Lord revealed was caused by a curse on a place. In the Bible, Joshua spoke a curse on Jericho, Joshua 6:36, and Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord, that riseth up and buildeth this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. That curse later came to pass in the time of King Ahab, 1 Kings 16:34. In his days did he o the Bethlehite build Jericho, he laid the foundation thereof in Abiram his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua the son of Nun. 4. 
Generational Curses Generational curses are passed down through the generations of a family. They are set in motion by sin that is not repented of by a male and the curse is passed through the male bloodline. These curses can pass to the female family members, but not through them. They can, however, pass to you through your mother's father and forefathers. Curses do not always manifest exactly the same way in every family member, and if a family member has very strong character and resists the sin, it seems to not manifest as strongly, or sometimes manifests slightly differently. You can recognize a generational curse by the fact that you will see the same condition, disease or problem in generation after generation of the same family. Multiple family members will manifest the same thing. When you see this, and if you see it in your own family, that indicates there is a generational cause for it. It is important to properly identify this type of curse so you can properly break it and get free of it, since the steps to break it involve repentance on behalf of someone else. Idolatry in the lives of modern-day Christians curses often come into our lives because of idolatry, which is preferring something or someone to God in your life, even only temporarily. All sin is idolatry and unbelief in some form. Because any time we sin, we have failed to trust God for something, and we have preferred the pleasures of our sin to Him. For example, if you are a Christian, but you are willing to sin for someone you love or like a lot, then that person or relationship has become an idol to you. You are willing to go against God and your beliefs for that person or relationship. We see this commonly now in those who call themselves Christians but live together before marriage. They say they are Christians, but they are living in the same house and having premarital sex, sometimes even going to church together. This should not be the case with us as Christians. Our lives should not look like the rest of the world. Anytime we do something like this, we are preferring that person or relationship to God, and that is a very dangerous place to be. Because anything that is a rival to God for your affections is something God is going to oppose. Don't live with someone outside of marriage and expect God to bless it because he will not bless sin and whatever you compromise your beliefs to keep, you will always lose. God will always oppose and fight against any other God in your heart. Do the right thing. Make the right choice. Don't act like the world just because everyone else is doing it and it's easier. Matthew 7:13 Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. Niv, Exodus 22:363 Thou shalt have no other gods before me. For thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. 5 Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, 6 And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. In verse 5 our great God tells us that he is very jealous over us and he will not tolerate us worshipping any other gods. He will not share us. He alone will be our God, or we will pay a price, and those for generations after us will as well, if we are male. Please note that these curses, also called generational curses, because they pass from generation to generation, are only passed through the male bloodline. They can pass to a daughter, but not through a daughter. That means you can't inherit them from your mom even though you see the effects of the same curse in her life, but you can inherit them from through her father or grandfathers. There is a wonderful illustration of how God punishes idolatry and the worship of other gods in 1 Samuel, chapter 5. The Ark of God was put into the temple of the people's god, Dagon. 1 Samuel 5-19 After the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, 
they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. To then they carried the ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. 3 When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon, fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. 4 But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon, fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold, only his body remained. 5 That is why to this day neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who enter Dagon's temple at Ashad step on the threshold. 6 The Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashad and its vicinity, he brought devastation on the Am and afflicted them with tumors. 7 When the people of Ashad saw what was happening, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must in ought stay here with us, because his hand is heavy on us and on Dagon our God. 8 So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked them, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Have the ark of the God of Israel moved to Gath? So they moved the ark of the God of Israel. 9 But after they had moved it, the Lord's hand was against that city throwing it into a great panic. He afflicted the people of the city, both young and old, with an outbreak of tumors. Niv, Dagon fell on his face before the ark of God dash every time I read that, I think every knee shall bow. Philippians 2:10. How do you know if there is a curse on you? So how do you know if there's a curse on you? Do you have behaviors or addictions you have struggled against? God deliverance for and tried to abstain from with no success? Do you have out of control anger, or a desire to commit violence for no reason or an out of control lust problem? Are you abusive to those you love and don't know why? Have you tried to conceive over and over with no success? Have you lived in poverty for years and no matter how hard you tried to overcome it, you never have enough? Have you worked hard all your life and yet you have nothing to show for it? Is there generation after generation of addiction and incarceration in your family? These are all signs of a curse. And there are more. The truth is, if you even think you may be under a curse, it pays to break it, just in case. The Lord revealed to me even after I had been in a close walk with Him for over 16 years, several curses I was under. Relief came immediately when I broke them. You can be free, too. Using this book this book can help anyone determine whether they are under a curse, and break it. There is one condition, you must be saved to use the knowledge in this book. That means you must believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that he died on the cross for your sins and that God raised him from the dead three days later. The information in this book is a powerful tool against the enemy's destruction in your life and the lives of your loved ones. This information can be used by anyone who believes in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The power of Jesus to break curses is available to every believer. If you are not a Christian, I invite you to become one now and let the Lord transform your life into something wonderful as only he can. The way is very simple. Just say the prayer below, and then watch him work miracles in your everyday life. Lord God in heaven, I have lived my life for myself, not giving you a chance to show me who you are. I am ready for a change. My way has not gotten me very far. I believe that you sent your only begotten Son Jesus as a sacrifice for the sins of mankind and that he died on the cross as payment for the sins of every believer. Based on the sacrifice of Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I am a believer now and I put my sins under the precious blood of Jesus on the cross. I believe you raised Jesus from the dead and that he now lives in heaven with you. I am tired and weary and I would like for him to lead my life now. I give my life to you and ask you to take over and make it into something wonderful. I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior now.
Thank you, Lord. Amen. If you said that prayer, you are now a Christian and you have the right and authority to use the most powerful weapon on earth against the enemy in your life dash the name of Jesus. In addition, God is your Father and you can now claim every promise in the Bible for yourself, because you just became a child of the living God. As a child of God, you now have power over the devil and his demons. This book will help you to use it. The Word of God, the Bible, is also called the Sword of the Spirit and it definitely cuts the devil down to size. May you wield the sword of the powerful Word of God against the enemy and break free of every demonic influence in your life. These are some of the scriptures in the Bible that relate to salvation, Acts 4:12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. 1 Timothy 2-5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, John 14 to 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father, but by me. John 10 to 9, I am the door, by me if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out, and find pasture. John 11:25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection, and the life, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, John 3 15 16, 15 that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 16 for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3:36 He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Are generational curses still relevant? At one time, I was unsure whether generational curses were still relevant, or whether they went away after Jesus was resurrected, so I asked the Holy Spirit about it. He answered me immediately and very clearly. Lord, are generational curses still relevant? Are they still in effect today? Why do you think Jesus could have an earthly mother, but not an earthly father? Wow! I saw it then. If Jesus had had an earthly father, sin would have passed through to his DNA because of generational iniquity, and he would not have been without sin. That settled it for me. I was really glad I asked the Lord. I could have researched for years and never figured that out on my own. In addition, the Lord later revealed to me generational curses I myself was suffering under and when I broke them, I got immediate relief. What does it mean to be visited with the iniquity of the fathers? An iniquity is an evil tendency you inherit. A twisted or wrong unjust or harmful way of thinking or being. So it is an evil tendency, or we might say a tendency towards evil that is visited upon us and our children because of something one of our forefathers did that they didn't repent to God of. We didn't cause it, but if we truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can break its power off of our lives. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law, and curses were part of the law. What? If I'm redeemed, why do I need to do anything else? Well, we're also saved by what he did, but that didn't come automatically, did it? No. We had to do something to claim it. We had to receive what Jesus had done and speak it. It's the same with curses. We were redeemed from all sin, are we free of all sin? Not unless we're standing on what Jesus did to set us free from it. So we need to claim or appropriate what the Lord Jesus did for us in order to claim it. It's kind of like if you won the lottery, the money would be yours by right, but you don't get it until you go up to the counter and show the winning ticket to claim it by telling those behind the counter that it's yours. We receive everything promised to us in the Bible by fully believing, 
and speaking that it's ours in faith. Speaking something in faith just means you speak it out of your mouth and believe in your heart it's true at the same time, without doubting. If you go back and forth between believing and doubting, that's being double-minded, and it shows your faith is not stable, or well-rooted. If you will read the Bible about what you are struggling to believe God for, it will establish your faith and you will stop doubting. When that happens, you will see your faith produce dash meaning the promises of God will begin to manifest in your life. James 1 to 8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Curses work like open doors to demons to come into your life and kill, steal and destroy your body, your relationships, your finances, your career, your children and anything else good you have. Exodus 34 to 7 keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children, unto the third and to the fourth generation. Emphasis mine, I believe iniquity in our lives because of unbroken curses put up barriers between us and God, making it harder to hear Him. Isaiah 59-1-2 Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. 2 But your iniquities have separated you from your God, your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Psalm 66 hours 18 minutes If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened, what is God's will? Dash God wants you free one Saturday in 2012, I was sitting on my bed in the tiny, old rent house in Princeton, Texas, with a pad of paper and Bibles and reference books spread all around me. I was studying for a show in the spiritual warfare series I was doing on blog talk radio, reading a story of a woman who was bound with many demonic spirits and I felt grief coming from the Spirit of God rise up in my spirit. I knew the Lord was sharing his sadness with me about something. Suddenly, he spoke to me. I desire my people would be free. My heart broke and tears streamed down my cheeks at the grief and sorrow I heard in his gentle voice. There seemed to be a great need for more teaching on deliverance and issues related to getting free of curses. That was the very reason I had begun the spiritual warfare series, because so many people wrote me asking for help in those areas. It is because of this dash the sorrow it brings the Lord when we are not free, and the many requests for help I have received since going on YouTube in 2009, that I am writing about and teaching on these curses. Hosea 4-6 My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. When Jesus hung on the cross, he took all the power of curses under the law and they were crucified with him, along with our sins. Galatians 3 13 14, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Emphasis mine, Jesus was made a curse for us. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Semicolon. The curses were taken away so we could enjoy the blessings of Abraham. Abraham was blessed in pretty much every possible way, so we want that. Years ago, when I was walking through a terrible financial wilderness, I would wonder why I heard so much about things like the blessing and the blessings of Abraham, and even though I tithed and offered, I didn't ever feel I saw them all manifest in my life. Now I saw from Galatians 3 colon 13 14 that the curses need to be removed first. Jesus bought us to the right to be free the same as he bought us the right to be saved, 
but we must take authority over the curses and command them to be broken off our lives to be free from them. Because removing curses also includes casting out demons, for those who may be new to spiritual warfare, I have included some information regarding demons and demonic influence. To many, the thought of demons and curses may sound scary, but it's not if you realize you have power over both through the blood of Jesus. What are demons and where do they come from? There are several theories about where demons come from, but our best information about the truth of any matter is always going to be the Word of God, so that's what we're going to look at. We cannot say exactly when angels were created, however, we can make some general deductions based on what we know from the Bible. Scripture reveals that these beings are directly connected to Satan, Matt. 12 colon 24 26, 25 hours 41 minutes, Luke 10 colon 17 20, Reverend 12 to 7. Matthew 12 colon 24 26 24 But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub the prince of the devils. 25 And Jesus knew their thoughts, and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought o desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. 26 And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself, how shall then his kingdom stand? Matthew 25 41 Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, emphasis mine, Luke 10 colon 17 20, 17 And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Emphasis mine, 18 And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. 19 Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Emphasis mine, 20 Notwithstanding in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you but rather rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. Reverend 12, 7 And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, emphasis mine, so it would appear that these angels, also called spirits and unclean spirits, fell at the same time Satan did by joining him in his rebellion against God which occurred before the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden since Satan was the serpent that deceived Eve there. Genesis 3-1 Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Matthew 17-18 and Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Emphasis mine, Revelations 20-2, And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Emphasis mine, how many angels fell and became demons? We don't know for sure. The first part of Reverend 12, Four gives us a clue, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Emphasis mine, myriads dash there are millions and perhaps billions or even trillions of angels. A third of a number like that would be a considerable amount, to be sure. Daniel 7 10, 10 A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, the judgment was set, and the books were opened. This was a vision of Daniel had of a great beast, Matthew 26 colon 53, 53 Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father? and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? A legion usually meant about six thousand, 
Emphasis line, Hebrews 12:22, 22, 22 But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, into an innumerable company of angels, emphasis line, to sum up, God created all the angels perfect and holy and we don't know how many he created, and some of them decided to disbelieve and disobey God, a lot like us. These were cast out and were given over to wickedness dash they had no part in God anymore, so all that was left was to be evil, same as us when we don't have God, nothing is left but to become wicked. So it appears demons may have once been holy angels who got kicked out of heaven for acting badly and now they are someplace else and no longer serving God, but the devil. Matthew 25 colon 41 then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, emphasis mine, Revelations 12-9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Emphasis mine, so if demons were created as angels, they probably share the same type abilities angels have. They are spirits. There is confirmation of this in scripture, Matthew 8:16. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick, emphasis mine, Luke 10:20. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. Emphasis mine, Mark 9:25. when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. Emphasis mine, so, we can tell from these scriptures that devils, Demons, foul spirits and spirits are all the same. We can think of demons as angels that have gone bad dash they defected to the dark side. They are spirits, but there is no longer any good in them because they turned against God. First, as with the holy angels, demons are individual spirits each with its own agenda. Angels held conversations with humans in many places in the Bible dash they bring or teach us things, so what do demons bring or teach us? Comma Daniel 9 colon 20 24 20 And whiles I was speaking, and praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, 21 Yea, whiles I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. 22 And he informed me, and talked with me, and said, O oh Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Emphasis mine, 23 At the beginning of thy supplications the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter, and consider the vision. Emphasis mine, 2470 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression, and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring an everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Daniel 10 colon 10 12 10 and, behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. 11 And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. 12 Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. 
Matthew 2 colon 11 13 11 And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down, and worshipped him, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense and myrrh. 12 And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. 13 And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Emphasis mine. They talked to the women at Jesus to Matthew 28 to 1 7 28 in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. To end, behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and sat upon it. 3 His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow, for and for fear of him the keepers did shake, and became as dead men. 5 And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. 6 He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. Emphasis mine, 7 And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and, behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. We can see that they have some measure of intelligence. This is revealed by the fact that Jesus and others conversed with him on different occasions, Matt. 8 colon 28 32, Mark 9 colon 25 26. Acts 19 colon 13 15. Matthew 8 colon 28 32 28 And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesons, there met him ta possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. 29 And, behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou who come hither to torment us before the time? 30 And there was a good way off from them and heard of many swine feeding. 31 So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. 32 And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and, behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and perished in the waters. Also we are told that demons have a belief system and doctrine that they hold to and propagate, item. 4-1-3. As with the angels, their knowledge is no doubt greater than man's for they have access to information that we do not. For instance. The demons possessing the man in Mark 1 colon 23 24 knew exactly who Jesus really was while the other people in the synagogue at that point had no clue. However we must reiterate that although demons may know more than we do, they are not omniscient they do not know everything. This is because they are created by God and therefore limited. Only God himself has all knowledge. The Bible also discloses that demons have some degree of emotions. Some of the passages we have seen show that they had a great fear of what Jesus was capable of doing to them and James 2.19 clearly affirms this fact. James 2.19 Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe, and tremble. Emphasis mine, obviously trembling indicates fear so they can at least feel fear, demons also have the ability of self-determination, or in other words, a will. If we are right about their fall being the result of following Satan in rebellion against God, then obviously that was a choice that some of them made. Jude also indicates that they possess this trait. Jude 1-6, and the angels which kept not their first estate, 
but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Emphasis mine, finally, they have a sense of self, but they seek to control our personalities and actions. We have already seen examples of how they use personal pronouns, I, we, us, to refer to themselves. They also have, or take, names according to Mark 5 to 6 9. They are more parasites than personalities, but they may not know that. Mark 5 to 6 9 6 But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, 7 and cried with a loud voice, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God, that thou torment me not. 8 For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. 9 And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Hebrews 1:14. Are they not all ministering spirits, sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Angels are essentially spirits that minister for us, demons don't minister for us, but against us. In scripture, we do not find any identifiable cases where demons were helpful to or ministering good things to humans, only where they were harmful to them. Demons are sent to steal, kill and destroy this can be deduced by the fact that in almost every instance of demon possession we see in the Bible the person possessed is being harmed in these ways. What should be noted, though, is that these people being hurt then were not yet Christians. They had no authority over demons. We do have authority over them and they are very afraid of a believer who is strong in Christ and in the Word of God, who knows they have the authority to command them. Mark 9 colon 25 26 25 When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. 26 And the spirit cried, and rent him sore, and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. Acts 19 colon 13 16 13 Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth fourteen and there were seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. Fifteen and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? Sixteen and a man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, and overcame them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Emphasis mine, demons sometimes have considerable power. This is revealed in the tremendous strength they imbue to the people they possess, Mark 5-2-4, Acts 19-16. Mark 5-2-4-2 And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, three who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains for because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Acts 19, 16 And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, and overcame them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. In Revelation we see that demons will be unrestrained for a time and will wreak much destruction by the fact that they will control certain terrible beings, 9 colon 10 11, 14 16. Jesus himself implied that demons are inherently powerful in some cases. Mark 9 colon 28 29, 28 And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? 29 And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing, but by prayer and fasting. As we have seen in many of our passages, 
any authority they have or activity they pursue is limited to what the God allows, cf. Reverend 9245-1415. They are neither omnipresent, everywhere at once, nor omnipotent, all-powerful. Only God himself has those characteristics. Demons are opposed to God. They have an undying hatred for God and the things of God. Demons are at work continually trying to destroy anything that is important to or that resembles God, which is why they hate all of us. Psalm 91 says God gives his angels charge over us. Satan attempts to copy everything God does, but in reverse dash to harm us, not bless and protect us. So if God gives his angels charge over us, what do you think Satan does to copy him? We don't want to spend all our time thinking about the enemy, but we also should not be ignorant of his devices as 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, lest he get an advantage of us. That is exactly why Satan does not want you reading this book, because it will give you the advantage over him. It will arm you to take back what he stole from you and to close the door to his attacks. Do not, therefore, be at all surprised if you come under oppression or some type of spiritual attack as you read this. And do not let that make you afraid to read it, or to act on it. Our lack of action will not stop their actions against us. Arm yourself with the knowledge once and for all against demons. Just rebuke the devil in Jesus' name and tell him you're going to read this book regardless. Keep reminding him that you have been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb of God. How to cast out a demon any time we break a curse, we need to also cast out any demons that came in with it. The reason is because the curse is the legal right, entrance, or ability of the demons to enter your life and afflict you or cause destruction in your mind, life or body. Think of the curse as the demon's doorway when you break the curse you crush their doorway. You cast them out then and since you have removed the curse, there is no house for them to come back to. Any time you need to cast out a demon, you simply command it to depart in the name of Jesus. Tell it to pick up its seeds and clean up its filth and go immediately into the abyss in Jesus' name. The seeds and filth are things they plant in your mind. You want them to take all that with them. Any time you have the urge to commit a sin, if you think a demon is involved, command it to leave you right then in Jesus' name. If it comes back, command it to leave again. They get tired of leaving and eventually leave you alone for a season if you stay on them like that. Sometimes we want to sin just because our flesh wants to, but often a demon is whispering to us, trying to talk us into doing something wrong trying to make what's wrong look right so we'll jump into it. Then they've got us. Watch out for them, they're sneaky. How to tell if the problem is a curse, a generational curse, or just a demon it may seem tricky to determine whether what is afflicting you is a demon, a curse or a generational curse, but it's all simple enough to fix that it won't matter once you understand. Once you have asked forgiveness for your part in the sin and renounced the sin, which means you are turning away from it, then you have cut ties with Satan on it and the demons must obey and leave when you command them. Breaking the curse keeps them from having a house they can run right back into so to speak when you cast them out. Our sin gives place to the devil, but going through these steps takes that place away. You always try to solve a problem at its simplest level first. When you repair something, if you're not sure what's wrong with it, you repair the simplest, least expensive possibility first. If I find unexpected water on my floor, I'm not going to order the house re-roofed right away, I'm going to look for a simpler, less expensive cause first. The main way to tell if there is a curse in place is if you ask forgiveness for your part in the sin and you renounce it and turn away from it and the influence and urge to do it just keeps coming back and coming back, then I would suspect a curse.
If I could also look at my family and at my forefathers and see the same sin running all through my family, then I would also suspect the curse might have come in generationally, and I would break it that way. How to break each type of curse Acts 319 Repent, then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, Niv, following are the steps I follow to break each type of curse. Curses we bring on ourselves through sin dash my sin curse there are other forms of curses besides generational dash one that is particularly interesting is word curses which I will try to write about more extensively in another book about the power of our words. The Lord has shown me some visions regarding the power our words carry. I think most of us underestimate this power. Regarding word curses, people who have authority over us can pronounce curses against us with their words. These curses are usually only on us, not on our children, but they still bring destruction. These curses are broken in a slightly different way. There can also be curses on places, and curses we bring on ourselves through sin. A common sin that brings a curse on you is trying to manipulate and control people. In 2006, I was involved in a situation where the outcome was extremely important to me. One day I was standing in front of the bathroom mirror doing my hair before leaving for work and my mind started manifesting weird thoughts, unreal stuff. I knew something was wrong because it didn't normally do that, and I thought maybe it was all the stress and strain I was constantly under. I began praying right away, then the Lord spoke to me. It's a curse of witchcraft. Repent and break it. Lord, I thought I broke that years ago, but okay. I will obey you. I immediately repented for the sin of witchcraft and broke the curse, then commanded the demons tormenting my mind to leave immediately. They left. Immediately the thought pattern stopped, and didn't return. One of the awesome things I have discovered about curse breaking is that relief comes immediately. Later on, the Lord revealed to me that was not for the sin of witchcraft before I was saved, because I had already been forgiven of that. It was for the sin of witchcraft for trying to manipulate and control my current situation. Which is the same thing as the other kind of witchcraft, and he showed me it brings the same curse upon the mind as the other kind of witchcraft. If you try to manipulate and control others by your words or actions, you may have brought a curse upon yourself that opens a door to demons to torment your mind. This can cause anything from strange thought patterns to depression to outright insanity. Stop and repent immediately, or it could end badly for you. How to break a sin curse Ask forgiveness for the sin, repent, turn from, and renounce the sin, command the curse to be broken in Jesus' name, cast out all associated demons and command them to clean up their filth and pick up their seeds. This is stuff they have put in your mind and go immediately into the abyss in Jesus' name. Thank and praise God for his help. My word curse over past years, I have prayed many times and asked God for healing. When I was traveling with my work and after I stopped and was working from home on writing the first book, I seemed to get sick constantly. Since I took vitamins and herbal supplements to boost my immunity, I was really baffled at the amount of sickness and pain I suffered. It seemed every day I was ill. Not long before I moved from the old house where God had led me when I came to Texas on his command in 2009, I was praying one day about it and the Lord showed me in my spirit how my mom had always told me I was sickly. I could remember even as a small child being told I was sickly. He revealed to me that statement had placed a word curse on my life and that I needed to break it. Immediately I broke it and cast out the demons I believed might be related to it. I will write in more detail about this in another ebook, but ever since that day, I have continued to improve. Since moving shortly after that, I have not been ill a single day. 
please note I do not write these things to dishonor my mother in any way, she is a wonderful mother and a devoted saint of God. She would never intentionally curse any of her children or loved ones. I use this story only for illustrative purposes, how to break a word curse ask forgiveness for believing the lie behind the words, repent and renounce the sin, command the words to fall to the ground and become as nothing in Jesus name, cast out all related demons by telling them to clean up their filth and pick up their seeds and go immediately into the abyss in Jesus name. Thank and praise God for his help. Curses on Places Dash A true story is for curses on places. In early 2012, I did a blog talk radio show, I don't remember which one it was, where the Lord gave me a prophetic message for a listener who had emailed me wondering why so many accidents happened near her parents' land in the Midwest the United States. The Lord told me very clearly that a murder had occurred on that land over 100 years earlier and now there was an innocent blood curse on the land. He showed me demons attached to the land that had a legal right to attack those on the roads near it. This woman's brother had died in one of the accidents and one of her sons nearly had. When the doctors told her the bad report about her son, she wisely refused it, and her son lived. When I told her what the Lord told me, she confirmed that her parents had known about a murder 100 plus years back, but no one knew that caused a curse to fall on the land. I gave her instructions on how to break the curse from off the land. I believe that the shedding of innocent blood always brings a curse. This includes abortion. What could be more innocent than an unborn child? Abortion, because it is murder allows a spirit of murder to afflict those involved, which could include anyone who helped convince the person to have an abortion or anyone involved in actually performing the abortion. This can manifest as such things as hate, or murder, or can manifest as suicide, murder turned inward, etc., and can pass down generationally through the male bloodline. An innocent blood curse can affect anyone who helps bring about an abortion in any way, and of course curses the land it is performed on as well. Proverbs 6 colon 16 17 16 These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, seventeen a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. How to break a curse on a place dash authority matters I believe a curse on a place, on land, needs to be broken by the owner or someone who has delegated authority under the owner. Our God is a God of order and order matters to him. Years ago, the Lord once gave me an important prophetic word for someone I knew. Excited about the word, I made the mistake of sharing it with a very prideful friend who then went behind my back and delivered the word to the person as if the Lord had given it to them, who was a mutual friend. It wasn't a word about anything personal or embarrassing, it was an encouraging word, so I hadn't thought that much of sharing it with my friend. Later I prayed, well Lord, they got the word you had for them. I guess it doesn't matter who delivered it. It matters to me. He said. The Lord proceeded to teach me that the maximum anointing would only be on that word if it was delivered by the person he gave it to to deliver. He also taught me that part of the reason for that is because that person has the personality and demeanor to deliver it the way he wants it delivered. I learned an important lesson from that. I was the person who had the authority and the right personality to deliver that prophetic word for the Lord and I should not have shared it with anyone else. I hadn't known that friend was jealous of the gifts and anointing the Lord had given me, but it became very clear then that was the case, and I ended the friendship. God will sometimes speak to someone to break a curse on a place and obviously when he does, they are anointed for that purpose. In the case of the story I tell about the young woman and her parents' land, obviously, they delegated authority to her to act on their behalf and break the curse. 
what I saw in the spirit when I was praying about that and the Lord revealed what had happened was that she needed to walk the property line, or as close as possible, with a bottle of oil, olive oil is the preferred oil for anointing, but I have used even cooking oil if that was all I had, and drop drops of oil along it while commanding every evil spirit to depart from the land in the name of Jesus after repenting on behalf of whoever had committed the murder and asking the Lord to remove their iniquity from the land, and while declaring the curse was broken in Jesus' name. Generational curses The first step to getting free of curses is to determine the kind you're under, if possible. Many curses will be generational curses dash iniquity of our forefathers that is being visited upon us because we felt temptations of the same types of sins. Others around us will most likely think oh, that just runs in the family, and curses do run in families, but we don't have to let them run over us. By the mighty power of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we can break them off our lives and be free of their influence and limitations. I personally believe it is very beneficial, since we don't know and can't know everything our forefathers were involved in, to break every type of generational curse off ourselves just in case, since all it takes is a simple prayer to do so. That is the only way to be sure we have removed them all. Curses can be present and lying dormant, because demons like to wait for the most opportune time to attack the time when they can do the most damage in our lives. Like when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, the word says Satan left him to wait for a more opportune time. The KJV says he left him for a season. We have seasons of temptation and they often come when we are worn down and weary, but they also show up frequently when we are on the mountain top of victory. Those are the two times we are most likely to fall. Luke 4:13. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Niv, so curses provide a legal entrance, or open door, for demons to come in. Demons wait and watch for the best time to tempt you to fall to the same sins as your forefathers so they can get you into a stronghold you will have to fight to get free of. That means there may be many curses on you and I that you have no idea are there. It pays to break every type of generational curse, closing all possible open doors. I will be doing ebooks on different categories of generational curses, and print books on a few of them if you need help breaking them. I am going to break each type myself, and will put the prayers I use in each book. To remove a generational curse, there are specific steps that need to be followed. Proverbs 26-2 says the curse without a cause won't land on us. Proverbs 26-2 like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse does not come to rest. Niv, that's why the enemy tempts us with the same sin as our forefathers did, so when we give in to the temptation and sin. He can put the curse on us and say it was deserved. Us sinning gives the cause for the door to be opened to the curse. So if we do something when we're tempted that opens the door and lets the curse in, it makes sense that we need to do something else to kick it back out and slam the door shut behind it. Sin calls for repentance. In order to rid ourselves of a generational curse, we need to repent for both ourselves and our forefathers. This does not remove the guilt of the sin from our dead forefathers, it only removes the iniquity of their unremitted sins from us. It is also very important in this process to be sure you have forgiven anyone you need to forgive so God can forgive you. Matthew 6 14 15 14 For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 15 But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Generational curses dash my battle with fear in early 2013, when I was recovering from a bleeding stroke, I found myself battling fear day and night. Since I have battled demons for years in spiritual warfare, few things truly scare me in a way I can't overcome, 
but not being able to take care of myself does, because I had no one else to do it. I was married, but Jerry was still in prison and could not take care of me at the time. I would wake up in the wee hours every morning, terrified, clutching his shirt and I would lay awake and pray until I finally fell back asleep, exhausted. Attacks of fear would hit me during the daytime as well, as I struggled to perform even simple daily tasks. Everything was so hard now. Walking up a flight of stairs left me exhausted for hours. Going out to lunch, for days. I didn't see how I was going to survive daily living, much less complete my calling for the Lord. To add to everything else, I had missed doing several radio shows because of the stroke, and donations had been down for months. Alarmingly so. I am totally donation supported and now unable to work, and I was becoming afraid I wasn't going to be able to pay my rent and buy food. How would I live? If I became able to work again and returned to work, I wouldn't be able to write the books and keep up the radio programs. I desperately wanted to finish the books the Lord wanted written, I knew he had said the body of Christ needed them for what was coming. I knew, too, that it was not his will I work. So many people were bound and my heart went out to them. I wanted to help them, but now I could barely function through each day myself and I had no help. I had used the last of my savings paying two friends to move me from one house to another. All I had to live on was what was coming in from week to week, and now I had the added expense of doctor visits and medicines, not to mention the thousands of dollars in medical bills from my hospital stay. The help moving was necessary, I was barely able to pack boxes, lifting them was out of the question with an unrepaired, open vessel in my brain. Putting down a deposit on the new place had been an extra expense as well but the new place was in a much quieter and safer neighborhood, a move I desperately needed to make since my son no longer lived with me. But things did not look good. I felt horrible physically, I was battling fear and anxiety night and day, and nothing seemed to be going well other than my marriage. I thanked God every day for my strong, caring husband. He was the brightest spot in my now dark and frightening world. He constantly prayed for me and encouraged me and reminded me to believe. It was miserable trying to move and unpack while feeling so unwell, plus trying to keep up the website and radio shows, all the while wondering how I would pay the bills. Plus since I had no health insurance when the stroke happened, there were now threats from collection agencies to think about. One day. Worn out from fighting the fear and trying to do my daily tasks, I began to pray really hard. Lord, what is the deal with this fear? I'm not usually a fearful person. What's going on? The Lord proceeded to show me I had inherited a generational curse of fear from my forefathers. It had been on my father, and manifested as control and manipulation. He showed me my mom also had one that she had inherited through her forefathers, and hers had manifested as chronic fear and worry. If it was possible to have a degree in worrying, I was sure mom had a PhD. As soon as the Lord revealed the fear curse on me, I broke it, and for the first time in my entire life, I was not plagued with fear and anxiety. I could not control my circumstances but at least being free of fear made me not as afraid about them. I praised God every day for revealing the source of that tormenting fear. How to break a generational curse, ask forgiveness, repent and renounce the sin, also repent on behalf of your forefathers for the sin and ask God to remove the iniquity of their sin from you, command the curse to be broken in Jesus' name, cast out all associated demons thank and praise God for his help. Also dash do not worry about breaking a curse that is not there, because nothing will happen if you do that. It is always better to break one that isn't there than to leave one unbroken that is. Break them all and be free.
It also does no harm to cast out a demon that is not there dash nothing will happen. It is better to cast out any you think may be there and be free. It is also important after getting free to remember to walk in forgiveness towards others and resist sin. We do not want to become bound again after getting free. Prayer to break the generational curse of lust Father, I humbly come to you and ask you to forgive me for my sins of lust and all sins related to being lustful. I know lust is despicable to you because of what your word says and I repent of and renounce all sins of lust and I turn from all sins of lust now in Jesus name. I also come to you and repent on behalf of my forefathers for their sins of lust and all sins relating to lust not to obtain forgiveness for them, which isn't possible, but to ask you to remove the iniquity of those sins from me, Lord, and I ask for that now. Now in the name of Jesus, I command the generational curse of lust to be broken off my life now dash I command it to fall to the ground and become as nothing, in Jesus mighty name. I command every demon associated with lust and sins of lust to clean up your filth and pick up your seeds and depart from me and go into the abyss immediately in Jesus name. I plead the precious blood of Jesus Christ over my mind, body and life. Lord God I praise you and I thank you for the precious blood of Christ and the authority of the name of Jesus. Amen. Prayer to break lust for food and using food for comfort Father. I humbly come to you and ask you to forgive me for my sins of lusting after food and all sins related to being lustful towards food. I know lust in any form is despicable to you because of what your word says and I repent of and renounce all sins of lusting after food and also of using food for comfort instead of turning to you for comfort, and I turn from all sins of lusting for food and turning to food for comfort instead of you now in Jesus name. I also come to you and repent on behalf of my forefathers for their sins of lusting for food and all sins relating to lusting for food and also using food for comfort, not to obtain forgiveness for them, which isn't possible, but to ask you to remove the iniquity of those sins from me, Lord, and I ask for that now. Now in the name of Jesus. I command the generational curse of lusting after food and using food for comfort to be broken off my life now dash I command it to fall to the ground and become as nothing, in Jesus mighty name. I command every demon associated with lusting after food and turning to food for comfort and sins of lusting after food and using food for comfort to clean up your filth and pick up your seeds and depart from me and go into the abyss immediately in Jesus name. I plead the precious blood of Jesus Christ over my mind, body and life. Lord God I praise you and I thank you for the precious blood of Christ and the authority of the name of Jesus. Amen. A little about us dash how we found Christ's blind his testimony unlike many Christians I know, I was not raised in church, and attendance there was a very infrequent part of our lives. Mom had a strong belief in God. But no one talked much about him at our house, though the living room usually had a Bible in it, and we were never allowed to place anything on top of it. We spent most of our time trying to survive my dad's drinking and the hours of verbal abuse that followed. My father never said grace over our meals, but we didn't miss it, because we had never known anything else. We grew up moving around northeast Texas following my father's construction work. He was a very skilled carpenter and a hard worker, but he drank and we were desperately poor. We did always have a roof over our heads, food on our table and clothes and shoes to wear, though, which was more than his father did for him from what I heard in the family. Moving so often, we had no long-term friendships from our childhood that followed us through our lives. We had few friends period, not being able to bring friends home, because we could never be sure what would be happening there. The spring of my 15th year, we moved to the Texas Gulf Coast. I met my husband Rick at a 24-hour restaurant in Texas City, while waiting tables one summer to make money for school clothes. 
Our first meeting left me thinking he was completely obnoxious, and it would be two weeks before I accepted his invitation to go on a date. By our second date, we were completely in love. I dropped out of school and married him in January of the following year, a month before I turned 16. We moved every few months that first year, my husband trying to find a place where he could make enough money for us to survive. Eventually, we moved back to his home near Street Louis. That was where the abuse began. I was seven months pregnant with our daughter the first time he knocked me to the ground. After that, it never stopped. At first, it was every month or so, but by the time I left the marriage eleven years later, it was every week. I gave birth to our first child, a daughter, late the first year we were together. It would be almost six months before either of us could find work in the Street Louis area, and we nearly starved there. After finally finding jobs and working for a few months, we lost them, and decided it was time to move. A year and a half later, we had moved to Princeton, Texas, near my parents, and our son was born. I first began dabbling in the occult and new age practices like candle gazing and reading tarot cards when I was 19 after reading about them in a library book. For a while, I read every book I could find on occult practices, delving deeper, and eventually began reading about witchcraft, learning how to cast spells. I never joined a coven, preferring to practice alone. Not living near a big city. I knew no other witches, and being married, I could not have attended the gatherings anyway. I had never felt I fit in any place my entire life anyhow, so not being part of a group did not feel strange to me. After suffering constant abuse for years, I was drawn to the power witchcraft offered. I thought if I could learn to cast the spells, I could change my life for the better. All throughout this time, my mom interceded for the Lord to save me. She knew I was headed down the wrong road and tried many times to warn me, but in my youth and stubbornness, I refused to listen to her. Several times over the ten-plus year period when mom was interceding, the Lord drew me and I searched for him. In my early twenties when the abuse in my marriage was at its worst, I felt him draw me again. I began praying reading whatever I could find, trying to find out more about him. For a while, his presence was with me, though I didn't understand why or what it meant, or what to do about it. I just remember feeling very comforted whenever he was near, and I desperately needed comfort then. Years later, I was again drawn to the Lord. At that time my husband and I lived in McKinney, Texas and I began to attend a small church there, taking our two children with me. I found Christianity in that small church, but I never found Jesus. I never felt any repentance for my sins or any fear or awe of the Lord's mighty power. As a result, I still did not understand that Christianity was not about rules but about relationship, and eventually I fell away. Soon after, my younger brother committed suicide. Two months later, after nearly 12 years of marriage, I left my husband and fled to Oklahoma with the children. It would be years before I sought the Lord again. After the divorce, all I wanted to do was have fun, to let the child in me come out and play as it had never been allowed to before, and I did. By my early 30s, I had returned to the occult. I didn't really believe in what I was doing, but I didn't really believe in anything else either, so it didn't matter to me. I was still searching for the truth. After years of partying and doing whatever I felt like, I began to feel the Lord calling me again. After feeling the leading for weeks, I visited some churches, I left each one filled with disappointment, and feeling even more lost than before. Whatever was in those churches, it did nothing to quell the longing I felt to find the real God. No one approached me and talked to me about salvation, 
or even seemed to care that I was there, and I didn't know enough about the God I was seeking to know what questions to ask of them. Not knowing where else to look, I returned to the world, and my life of partying and having fun. Jesus was not in the church, and I didn't know where else to look for him. In the spring of 1996, I was working as a seismic permit agent when I was assigned to permit part of a 3D seismograph job in Chickasha, Oklahoma. The job was projected to last at least six months, and after much begging, I had persuaded the crew chief to allow me to rent a furnished apartment instead of another motel room. A very interesting young girl in the complex whose parents were ordained ministers became friends with my son who occasionally stayed with me there. The young girl intrigued me. She was a pretty young girl with a friendly personality, but it was more than that. She was very open about her Christian faith, and I saw a peace and a joy in her I had never seen in a Christian before. I saw a conviction dash she lived what she believed and she did it joyfully. I had never seen anyone so young that was so strong and so joyful in their Christian beliefs. One afternoon in early summer, the young girl came to visit, and found me at my dining room table reading my fortune with playing cards. She paused for a few seconds, tilted her head slightly and asked, You know it's wrong to do that, right? I smiled. Here we go. I knew the drill. She was about to hit me with a lecture about how much of a sinner I was and how I should turn to her God to fix me. Boring. I hoped it wouldn't take long. I know the Bible you believe in says it's wrong, if that's what you mean, I answered, still looking at my cards. Okay, that's all I wanted to know, she said smiling, and bounced off into the living room. I stopped and thought about what she had said. I had been different my entire life. Basically, I had never fit in any place, so I was accustomed to others not approving of me, and had long since ceased caring about their opinions. It wasn't that I cared she said it was wrong, it was the way she had said it that intrigued me. She wasn't offensive. She didn't beat me over the head with her beliefs. She shared them in a way that was less condemning, and more like conforming. I decided I liked her even more for allowing me to see the way Christians believed without degrading me for the way I did. Her response made me curious about the Christian faith. I had tried it a few times before, and fallen away each time. The dry churches I had experienced in my young adulthood had been filled with older people of somber face who seemed like they were just doing time there to get good marks for attendance, waiting for the sweet by and by. I wanted no part of the dry, boring life, but this young girl had something else. She seemed happy about being a Christian. Could there be a way to be happy and be a Christian, too? Was it possible to do right things and be happy about it? I had never seen joy before in a Christian like she had, or the peace I saw in her eyes, and I wanted it. No amount of whiskey and dancing had ever given me what she had, and I knew it. In my heart, I prayed a silent prayer to the God I did not believe in. If you're real, show me, and I'll follow you. On July 28th of that year on a quiet Sunday afternoon, there was a knock at the door, and it was the young girl. I was home with my live-in boyfriend at the time, just hanging out. I have a message from God for you, she stated, Matt factly. My eyebrows shot up to my hairline. re e e -ly. I asked. Is this some kind of a joke? What could her God possibly want to say to me? Yes, she stated. Come with me. With that she turned and began descending the stairs. It was obvious whatever it was, she did not want to say it in front of my boyfriend. Oh well, I was bored anyway. Let's see what this is about. Closing the door behind me, I followed her out into the bright sunlight of the July afternoon down the stairs and out into the parking lot. She walked a ways and then stopped, 
turning to face me. The Lord said to tell you that he has a plan for your life and the way you're living is not it, she stated, looking me in the eye. I laughed. Yeah, I can imagine it wouldn't be. For years I had lived a life of drinking, partying and chasing cowboys. He said to tell you that you have always known you were special, that you were not like everyone else. You have been out in the world playing for years. Now the time has come when you must choose. He has a very special work for you to do, but you only have a short time to decide whether you will accept it or not. By this time, she had my full attention, and I wasn't laughing anymore. My eyes widened with surprise and my jaw dropped. He was answering my silent prayer. And if he was answering, that meant he was real. And. He was alive. He said to tell you that if you will accept this work, he will open up the windows of heaven and pour out all the blessings on you that he has held back all these years you've been living in sin. He's real. He's real. And he answered me. He knows I'm here. He knows who I am. He answered me. In that split second in my spirit, I saw a forked road. I knew the choice was mine and mine alone, and I felt that he would not force me to choose his way or even be angry with me if I did not choose his. I also felt very strongly that, although I had the right to say no to his plan, I wouldn't be on planet Earth very much longer if I chose to say no. As I thought back over the terrible emptiness and loneliness I had felt for years, and how nothing ever made me feel truly joyful. I knew I wanted to give his plan a try. I knew, in spite of the fact that I did whatever my flesh felt like doing, I wasn't nearly as happy as I appeared to be or as I tried to convince others I was. My plan isn't working out all that great anyway. I'll try his plan. Dash Lord. If you can do something with my life, you can have it. And that was the beginning of my real walk with God. Immediately, I began making changes. I told the boyfriend he had to move out. I bought a Bible, and I began listening to Bible teachings. That night, I had a long talk with the Lord. Lord, I can't promise you I'll never fall. We both know I have a lot of sin in my life. I know it won't all go away overnight. I am going to trust you to show me once and at a time what you want me to let go of, and I will do my best to obey you. And I promise you that if you'll never give up on me, I'll never give up on you, and when I do fall, I promise you I'll always get back up and try again. I won't ever just give up again like I did in the past because now I know for sure you're real and you even made a plan for my life. You know me. Jerry's testimony in 2003, after I was released from prison, Glinta and I tried to continue our relationship but she and I, we walked in different ways and those ways led us to walk in different directions. Over the next nine years, I would walk through the darkness as she walked in the wilderness. I returned to prison in 2007 for what I decided would be the final time dash final not because I'd never return again, but because I wouldn't ever leave. I came back to prison determined not to leave, but to leave a mark. Once again, I fought my way to the top dash only to find myself lying on the bottom. A decade later and I was back in the same hole, in the same prison, for the same thing. Some things change, but I wasn't one of them. I was there in the whole last year when a letter came in the mail for me. I couldn't believe it when I saw the name in the upper left hand corner dash glint to Lomax. I sat there on my bunk in the cell, my hands literally shaking as I held the envelope, looking at her name. This part will sound silly, maybe even dumb. But I didn't open that envelope dash and not the same day I got it. Sitting there turning it over in my hands, I noticed there wasn't a smiley face drawn on the back. Every single envelope I'd ever received from her, there were hundreds, had a little smiley face drawn on the back. 
except the one I held in my hands. It wasn't a letter from the woman I once knew dash it was a letter from the only woman I have ever loved like that. I was afraid the missing smiley face was a hint at the letter inside dash maybe she was writing me to tell me she was happily married and just happened to think of me, or worse, maybe she looked me up and saw that I was in prison again and was writing me to tell me how disappointed in me she was. Maybe. Maybe I should have just opened the letter right away. She did look me up online and when she saw I was in prison again, she was angry, but she didn't write to tell me the dash she wrote to say that no matter where I was or wasn't, she would always be my friend. Note from Glinta, the anger wasn't at Jerry, but at how his life was going dash I wanted him to have better, I wanted him to be happy, I wrote her back and she wrote me again. It was as though we had never stopped writing, like we never walked off in different directions. I loved her as much as I always had, more. A decade later and our feelings for one another remained the same. Also unchanged though, were the ways we walked in. She was walking ever closer to the Lord, with him and in his ways dash the way I was walking, I might as well have been lying on the floor. I wasn't a Christian and I didn't have any plans to be. Even the best laid plans. I sent Glinda a drawing I'd done, a self-portrait that I was sending to an art therapist I had once worked with. When she got my self-portrait, I asked her to do one for me. She usually doesn't draw much, but she mentioned having done one in the past few months and I asked her to send me a copy of it. It was on a Monday in June that I got the copy of her self-portrait. I had been moved emotionally by artwork before and in my life, I've felt plenty of pain dash everything from fractured bones to a broken heart, but it was always my pain. I hurt. When I saw Glinda's pain, the way and places she hurt, I felt it. I was moved emotionally by her artwork and physically to my knees, for her pain hurting for her, I don't know that I've ever hurt worse. There in the cell, literally on my knees, I asked God to take all of her pain. I told him that I would give him all of my pain if he would give me all of hers. I gave him more than my pain dash I gave him all of me, with all my heart. He gave me more than her pain. 2 dash he gave to me her hand and all the love she holds for me dash he gave me his hand and of the love he holds for me. As I said, I've always believed that God did and does exist and I'd been told countless times of and all about God's love, but I'll tell you, it's a lot easier to believe in God's love when you feel it. With God and Glinda. One of the saddest places became the happiest and for the first time in all time. I didn't feel the same. I felt the change. After I was released early from the hole, Glinda came to visit and not long after that, we were married. I'd like to explain in detail, exactly how that happened dash not the ceremony, but the destination. How we could walk away from one another in different directions and then arrive at the same destination a decade later. The details are God's. There is no other explanation. My life before was a living one day at a time, just trying to get through the day to the next one, and hoping that somewhere up ahead, there might be something better. It was a lot like dying, one day at a time. My life then had no purpose. I had no purpose. Now the only thing done is yesterday, and that something more up ahead? That something better? It's here now. It's today. It's my life, the life that I'm living and loving dash a lot. Even though I want to be free to go home to my wife and take care of her, to lift the burden from her, I can honestly say if the gate opened up right now and I could have my freedom this minute if I took my old life back, or I could keep my life in Jesus and stay incarcerated, I'd walk right back into my cell and stay here and I'd keep living my life, one day at a time for him, just like I'm living it today. A blog Jerry recently wrote, published on our blog site.
the three of us, that I really love, recently, I saw a man on television talking about the destruction caused by Hurricane Sandy. He said it only take one second of bad to erase a lifetime of good. I know that's true. I know it's true, too, that it only takes a second of good to erase a lifetime of bad. One year ago June 18th, it was what K-Love Radio called Make a Difference Monday. On Make a Difference Monday, I started living for Jesus Christ, living for His purpose. I know His purpose is good, His word is true. I'm living in a place that is literally made up of lifetimes of bad. A place where so many love to hate, but I'm living proof that love erases hate. I'm living the proof that one second of good can erase a lifetime of bad. Epilogue Jerry and I have been married just over seven months at the writing of this ebook and at present, he is still in prison in Ohio. The day I married him was the happiest day of my entire life. Just three weeks after I returned from marrying him at the prison in Ohio, I suffered a bleeding stroke at the house where I lived in Texas. What followed would prove to be a terribly dark time for both of us as I lay in the hospital for nearly a month, trying to recover, and he struggled to get information on how I was. But our God is faithful, he brought us through it all and strengthened us and our faith in the process. We talk on the phone daily and work on writing projects together, also corresponding by mail. We look forward every day to someday getting to actually live together like other married couples, but even now we both are happier than we have ever been, enjoying our marriage, planning our future prison ministry, and serving God with our whole hearts. As we look forward to our future, we try not to look too far yet, not knowing when Jerry will be able to come home. We look to our next book together and we look forward to the prison ministry we will do together and touch many lives for Christ, showing others who live in darkness what Jesus means to us. We pray this book is a great blessing to you. Glinta and Jerry Link